Hi students, Professor Matt here. Today's brief lecture is on race, ethnicity, and post-colonial analysis. Now central to race ethnicity theory is the belief that racism and ethnocentrism have been thoroughly entrenched in language, literature, art, and social institutions. Now ethnocentrism is the belief that one's own culture is superior to other cultures. We can define race as the physiological characteristics as well as the social history, which is the region of original habitation, versus ethnicity, which is the non-physiological aspects of culture, which include um, certain identifying markers such as religion, customs, and language. And by customs, we might be referring to food, clothing, um, entertainment, holidays, etc. Now, after the civil rights movement in the 1960s, the traditional canon of literature was finally opened up to include more racially and ethnically diverse populations. Prior to this point, the adage was that the literary canon consisted of dead white guys. And of course, today that isn't true so much. It's been opened up to far more diverse voices. The famous uh, African-American novelist and literary critic Toni Morrison said, in order to be white, one must construct an other, or black. And it's a very apt way of conceptualizing the way that uh, race theory can work. Now, the development of African American literature follows the feminist trajectory, whereby we first have African American writers who are trying to write as uh, like white authors. So that's following in the, the traditional canon of white literature. The, the second phase involves angry texts, so kind of realizing the, the history of racism that's implied in the publishing literary industry and then responding to that um, in a very naturally angry way. And the third phase kind of pushes through or moves beyond that anger to uh, embrace a genuine identity, a legitimate point of view, and to begin a, an actual self-definition. Now, of course, the ultimate freedom comes in being able to write whatever one wants to and not having to define their race. So as an African-American, you can write as a person and not having to define oneself as a collective in the way that a feminist um, might write as a person as opposed to writing a female novel that, that defines what it means to be uh, a woman. So that's the, the ultimate end goal. Now post-colonial theory looks at the aftermath or the effects of colonialism and more recently we see these lines being blurred between business or economic interests and national interests. So traditionally it was, it was looked at more of a political regimes and now it's more in the form of the multinational corporation. Now the economic basis for colonialism typically is veiled on a national level by certain rhetoric. These are things that you will hear politicians say all the time. For example, uh, liberation of a people from oppression or national security, making the world safe from de for democracy, bringing evildoers to justice. Right? I'm sure that you've all heard a politician utter one of these aphorisms at one time or another. And, of course, they make really good sound bites, but what lies behind this is typically some economic or business interest uh, that may involve the exploitation of certain natural resources that exist in a region of the world. The concept of an east-west binary, which, um, if we think back, is a really structuralist way of looking at things, but the east-west binary is not so much a geographical uh, certainty but rather a way of conceptualizing or constructing an other. Because if we think uh, that, you know, if we exist on a globe rather than a flat surface, there really is no absolute east or west because anything could be east or west from any other point on a globe. But we, we construct the notion of east or west, how this has been used historically, is from a very ethnocentric uh, European point of view. Now, the very famous philosopher, sociologist, historian, literary critic Michel Foucault has this wonderful quote. Uh, he says, regimes of truth are not a matter of having ideas or laws forced down your throat, but rather a circulation of knowledge, of ideology, through which consent establishes certain attitudes of bias. And I think that quote really illustrates very well, you know, the current state of affairs whereby we no longer uh, in, a, in a democracy have totalitarian regimes or corrupt police forces that force power or coercion down our throats um, in terms of saying, you know, we're going to ban books, burn books, you know, you must believe these things or you're going to go to jail, so forth. We don't have thought police in that way. 
but rather the way that power is deployed is in the entire structure of society. And this is how knowledge is disseminated, um, is through what no Noam Chomsky calls manufacturing of consent. So it's reinforced through the media, it's reinforced through the political system, it's reinforced through our educational system, and voices of resistance tend to get marginalized or demonized uh, rather than you know put in jail or burned at the stake. Another example of how this works is through religion. Right? Many Christians believe that the Bible is a universal gift because they want to believe that their religious ideas are transcendent. Right? They transcend their history, their local origin, the culture that they come from, um, and it's, it's not so much that one individual believes a certain thing, right? Uh, this is what Foucault calls the difference between holding a point of view and a regime of truth, right? Holding a point of view is to say that, you know, such and such seems so to me, uh, but a regime of truth is to, to take that point of view and then to foist it on others and say, you know, everyone must believe this thing. Now, the term post-colonial might be a bit optimistic, um, maybe even naively so, because we are still very much in the throes of colonialism the same way that the Marxist term uh, late capitalism uh, might also be naively optimistic because capitalism is very much alive and well. So other theorists have been eager to use the term empire theory to replace post-colonial. Some of the key principles, number one, Categories of race and ethnicity have been used in ways that have empowered some and oppressed others throughout social institutions and language. So if we look at the differences in language, customs, religions, etc., these can be used as the basis or the framework to differentiate an us versus a them, or to allow individuals to identify a self whereby they judge someone else as an other. Uh, and this is one of the basic ways that we can understand the world. And again, it, it is a very sort of structuralist way to look at things. Now, of course, implied in that binary self and other is an implicit hierarchy that works itself out. So that's to say that if I establish myself as one thing and you as another or an other, right, that might allow things like anger, hatred, scapegoating, and xenophobia to creep in and we, we put that or we hoist that onto the other. Uh, xenophobia involves a, a fear of other cultures and of course scapegoating is blaming other cultures um, or races for certain things, uh, be they economic troubles or social ills, etc. And ultimately these derive from ignorance of cultural differences and of course from Foucault's notion of a, a regime of truth. So it's not so much that I have a particular culture and I see the world in a way, but I move to, uh, to try to universalize my experience and say everyone must believe or do things the way that I do them and if they don't that's strange and it's inferior or you know even worse we might try to, to scapegoat or form the basis of hate on that. Of course racial slurs are another way that majority groups try to demonize minority voices and you know a key question is can the marginalized people reappropriate those slurs? So can they take those racial slurs and use them and strip the power away from the majority and re-empower themselves through the use of those racial slurs within their own uh, subculture. And of course that's a very uh, delicate question, a very tricky question uh, and difficult one to answer. The second key principle is that di the differentiation of peoples are reflected in centuries-long history of imperialism and co colonization. And the, we have this concept of the civilized society exploring an untamed uncharted wilderness, right? And this idea of, of the civilized versus the savage, right? So the civilized people are those who are colonizing and the savage people are the natives. And that sort of logic has been used to justify exploitation and colonization. Um, whether it's the European colonization of Africa or the European colonization of America, uh, the United States, etc. And you know, post-colonial analysis is, is going to examine the aftermath of that colonization and the profound changes it's had on the colonized cultures. The third key principle is the differentiation of peoples and its political consequences are reflected in literature. So this is to say that literature is a glimpse into the belief systems of a culture. It's a, a cultural text, it's something that's constructed, that is of course full of both implied and explicit belief systems. 
and these can either reaffirm or challenge the status quo. Putting theory into practice. So one way, easy way that you can apply race, uh, ethnicity, postcolonial, or empire theory to text is to look at the various races and cultures that are portrayed in those uh, in that piece, in that text, in that literature, and start to pay attention to that. And think about what are some of the opportunities that are available to characters from minority races compared to characters from my majority races. You know, how are their life experiences different? What values exist or what hierarchies exist in the text? And ultimately, do the texts serve to reinforce the status quo? Or is it an opportunity to challenge the status quo? And when you start to think about those things, it's, it's a good avenue into applying that criticism to literature. This is Professor Matt signing off until next time.